responsible for putting together this exhibit of John's that was at the museum for six, eight weeks. It's now passed. Uh, but if you Google uh, Wisconsin Museum of Art, is that where you start out? Uh, yeah, we did a catalog for the exhibition. Um, before I came to, um, to Evansville tonight, I went into the museum shop and said, do you have any copies of the catalog? Because I could take some and hopefully sell some. And he said, we've sold out. However, thanks to the miracles of the way the publishing industry works these days, uh, if you go to our website, which is very easy to remember, wisconsinart.org, very easy. Go to the shop button, it'll say eBooks, and you can actually download a copy for free. So you can read my essay, you can see everything that was in the exhibition, you can just download it for free. And if you do that, and you still feel like I would really like to have a copy of, hard copy, physical copy of this, we got, we use a company called blurb.com, B-L-U-R-B.com, and you can, you can order one copy and they will send it straight to your house. So that's kind of how modern publishing works, is museums don't have to buy hundreds or a thousand copies of a catalog and then keep your fingers crossed that you're gonna sell them. You can just basically order them in ones, twos, or any number that you particularly want. The, the per unit cost is a little higher, obviously, because you're doing, you know, doing the whole bulk thing. And I, but I think it came in at around the low forty dollars or something. But it's full color all the way through. It's a really nice catalog. So. All right. So I'm going to start. All right. Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming out. I don't, I don't know what to expect, but I didn't expect quite this many. People, but I'd like to thank Jennifer, the Evansville Grove Society, and the Theodore Robinson Society for sponsoring this tonight. And I kind of wrote this in my remarks that I was, I knew I was going to be a little envious of many of you because as, as we've kind of discussed, I never met John, and unfortunately, um, but I loved, I knew I was going to hear some good stories here tonight. So thank you for sharing those um, with us. So I'm going to kind of be facing this way, you're going to be looking this way, and I will just, can you guys all see me? No. Okay, you can all kind of see past me. Can the light be down? Well, the thing is, if I if I drop the lights too much, I'm not going to be able to see my notes. Let's see if I can read them. Let's see if I can read them from here. Well, that's going to be touching down. Well, let's see if I can. Yeah, I'm going to need some more light. Let's see. Let's see. Is that better or that better? Which is better? That one? They don't have like a yeah. What's, no. I don't know which one's better. I just, I'll just put it like that. Go ahead. All right. Yes. Well, anyway, over the course of a remarkably long career that spanned eight decades, from the 1930s to the 2000s, John Milley had 60 solo shows and participated in around 140 group exhibitions. That is an incredible number. I mean, that's basically a solo show a year, plus probably at least two and a half group shows a year. And yet the recent Wildes Wildes exhibition at Moa was unique because, as I just said, it was Wildes' personal collection literally taken off the walls from his home. And many of these had been featured in different exhibitions over the years but many were not, and some were on view, either individually or collectively, for the first time ever. I'm sorry. Okay. And these were works that they held on to. So these were works that had a lot of significance for John and Shirley, well, John, Helen, and then Shirley, because they did hold on to them. Actually, I think we can go with that. I think I can. Is that okay? Yeah. I, I wrote this. I should be able to. <laughs> I should be able to read it. <laughs> But in 1913, six years before John Wilde was born in Milwaukee. Is that worse now? Now is that out of two of us. Okay. That's that one. That's bad. Yeah, that gives me just a little. Okay. In 1913, six years before John Wilde was born in Milwaukee, there was an art exhibition in New York that changed everything in art in America. The Armory Show. Here's a season ticket for the International Exhibition of Modern Art. And it was, you can see it was held at the 69th Regiment Armory on Lexington Avenue. 
and it introduced modern or foreign art officially to America. And it became known as the Armory Show because of where it was held. And amongst those foreign artists were featured Picasso, although he was not yet famous enough to even warrant top billing. But you can see the kind of caliber of artists who are in this show. Ang, Delacroix, Degas, Cezanne, Redon, Renoir, Monet, Seurat. You can see the list here. I mean, that's pretty much a, it's a pretty stellar, stellar list. But Picasso was included, and also Georges Braque, B-R-A-Q-U-E, and many, many more. And most were already part of an established art history curriculum, but some were not. But when John Wilde enrolled at Madison in 1938, he lived at 126 Langdon Street for the duration of his undergraduate years. He was admitted on a restricted basis, which I have thought was hilarious. That he was, you know, here's somebody who went on to be a professor emeritus, 34 years at the university. He got in on a restricted basis <laughs> because he had not studied plain geometry. And it's really funny. I was actually in a house in Wauwatosa yesterday. Um, we were kind of getting some stuff that had been donated to the museum. And I kid you not, I found a little copy of a book on plain geometry. And it was probably the book that Wilde would have had to study. But he didn't study it, so he was only admitted on a restricted basis. And in fact, here is the copy from the freshman admissions office to Mr. John Henry Wilde. And it says, we have received your application for admission to the university. This is approved, but because you lack plain geometry, it is necessary for us to admit you on a restricted basis. <laughs> Algebra and geometry are still required for unrestricted admission to the university. When you have definitely decided in which field you desire to major in the university, kindly let us know. For certain courses you may take geometry must be made up within your first two years. So I think that's just great. He just got in. Just got in. But he studied with Mr. James Watchers, who was a professor of art of art history, and an artist in his own right. <clears throat> and amongst many accomplishments of James Watchers, he wrote a book called The Craft of Old Master Drawings, and found no pupil more willing, more interested, than the young John Wilde. However, Wilde's engagement with artists predated his college years. As a student at Washington High School in Milwaukee, he met established artists such as Paul Clemens, Santos and Gali, and Alfred Sessler. While he was still in high school, and the seed of his future career took hold here, because this contact instilled in Wilde the notion that art could actually be a career. So, Wilde comes to Madison from Milwaukee, he's admitted on a restricted basis, and he's at Milwaukee, he's at Madison from 1938 to 1942. And he took classes in philosophy, history, sociology, geography, and of course art history. An art teacher, art history teacher such as Watrous, with whom he would actually later befriend and share a studio on campus, and John Kynitz introduced him to the work of old masters such as Sandro Botticelli. And take a look at these images and try, I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with Wilde's work, but take a look at these images and put yourself in the point, in the kind of mindset of being a young freshman or maybe a sophomore in college. You're getting these art history classes and this is what you're seeing. Look at the way these artists compose their pictures, look at the imagery, look at the way the figures interact, and keep Wilde's work in mind. So we've got Botticelli, Pisanelli, a bird. Oh, <coughs> didn't see that coming. <laughs> Fra Angelico, detail of the last judgment. <coughs> Lucas Cranach, Venus and Landscape. How many, how many nudes did Wilde do over the years? Albrecht Dürer, portrait of a brother. Albrecht Dürer, and what was Wilde? He was the professor of drawing. Who else do we have? Jan van Eyck, self-portrait. What did John Wilde do? Self-portrait after self-portrait after self-portrait. Hieronymus Bosch, I mean, look at this crazy stuff going on in the sky. 
Giuseppe Archibaldo, portrait of Rodolfo. Vegetables, apples. Peter Bruegel the Elder. All this kind of chaotic stuff going on in the painting. So, this is what the young Wilde is getting fed through all of his art history classes. And he was taken by the intimacy and the detail in the work of these artists, where attention was required to appreciate not just the subject, but also the technique and the subtle use of color. And his response was direct. It's clearly evident in drawing, as this drawing, self-portrait, myself, age 19, from 1939, in which Wilde clearly channels Albrecht's self, Durer's self-portrait. I'll just sit back and part here. Look at the hand. See, clearly challenging, channeling what he's been learning in class. But Wilde also learned about more contemporary artists such as Picasso, Georges Braque, and Max Ernst. Again, look at the birds, look at the compositions. And so you get these artists who are applying additional materials to their pieces, such as newsprint and these early paintings, creating a kind of collage that blurs the distinction kind of between reality and artistic creation. You're actually kind of sticking something onto the canvas. You can see it here with uh, the Braque and also the Picasso, where you know, it, it's not just what he's drawing or what he's writing on the canvas, but he is actually kind of sticking things on there as well. Will they follow his suit? Again, the sponge absorbing all these influences from class. Here's the still life, the bathers from 1940, great big piece of newsprint stuck right onto the canvas there. Here's another early piece, the US is at war with Japan, invasion by land, sea, and air. Kind of got that kind of, you know, early composition, but you can see this even as early as 1941. This kind of almost desolate landscape, kind of with odd people and odd things located throughout. So even in 1941, you can still, even though he's learning about the past, you can see the seeds of what is to come for the next 60 years. And here's an amazing early self-portrait that was in the exhibition myself as a reader from 1941. And again, this has got elements of collage. It's also you know, a little strange because you know if you look at the arm and the hand coming up there, he must have the strangest forearm in the field. <laughs> really doesn't quite work anatomically, but it, what's great is he's actually stuck some elements of newspaper on there, but there's a there's there's like a push pin on there and the push pin's painted, but the thing is, is the push pin is ostensibly holding to the wall is actually real. So what you've got is the slightly earlier European influences are slowly being shed in favor of more personal themes that would remain constants for the rest of his career. Self-portrait figures and objects in desolate landscapes, and the, pre the appearance of reality cloaked in artificiality. And this transition was aided by other means. From 1936 to 1946, oh, actually, here's, a, here's a, one of his, this is a critical early piece. This is an American interior from 1942. This is the preparatory sketch for it. And then here's the painting. And this is really important um, because, as some of you know, as many of you probably know, John's first wife, uh, Helen, was in the theater department. And look at this painting. It has, in many ways, the appearance of a stage set. You've got these walls kind of creating an illusion that you're looking at the exterior of a building or even somehow the interior of a building at the same time. So will these painting up? Uh, an image here where when you go to the theater, you know you're in a, an artificial environment that this room or a street scene or whatever you're looking at on the stage, you know that it's not real, but you have to kind of suspend your belief and you're like, what I'm looking at is real. So will they, here in 1942, this is a really important painting because of it shows the influence from his wife, first wife Helen, but I think it's also very important because he calls it an American interior. So all of this, Picasso and Braque and all those old masters, 
It's all European stuff. He's kind of firmly planting his flag and saying it's an American interior. But there's also something else going on in Madison. I mean, he's getting to know Marshall Glazier and Carl Creevy and Sylvia Fine, but the artist in residence at Madison is John Stuart Curry. And John Stuart Curry was, he was the artist in residence at Madison, the first artist in residence at an American university. And he had nothing to do with the art department, strangely enough. We did a John Stuart Curry show last year, and again, I got access to the files at Madison. And Curry was actually brought to the university through the College of Agriculture. I'm sure many of you have been to the chase and in the big portrait of Chris Christensen striding through the corn. He was the dean of the College of Agriculture. It was Chris Christensen who talked to the Brittingham, Brittingham Trust and said, you know, will you fund John Stuart Curry to come to Madison? And they said, sure. And there was a fantastic letter in there from Oscar Hagen, who was the head of the art history department. So Wilde would have certainly known Oscar Hagen. Uh, this is in about 1933, but Hagen was there for many, many, many years. And there's a great letter from Oscar Hagen basically to Chris Christensen saying, yeah, it's really great that Curry's coming. He'll bring prestige to the university. He's a well-known artist. Keep him in the College of Agriculture. <laughs> Don't bring him into the art department. Because you know, there's the studio arts, there's art history and art education, and the letter's basically if you bring him in here, and this is the exact word he used, I will have to put up with a whole lot of bickering. <laughs> because here they, you know, they bring in Curry. I don't know if actually Curry ever had an MFA, but he, at the time he was one of the top best known artists in the country. But they bring him in, there's no teaching responsibilities. They build him a lovely studio on campus. There's no restrictions on him earning any kind of side money from all kinds of other gigs in the the city or the community. So I think it was kind of like, you know, if we bring him in and we put him in this department or that department, you know, all these people with MFAs or good teaching loads and everything else, we're like, he's getting paid way more than me. I don't get a nice studio all to myself. So Oscar Hagen was like, just keep him in the <laughs> Don't bring him anywhere near me. <laughs> so here's John Stuart Curry, self portrait from 1937. This would have been done the year after he actually came to Madison. And in some ways, Curry's work was very, I'm not saying he painted it because of who basically sponsored him into the university, but his work can always be, I think has to be looked through the prism of who brought him to the university. That was the College of Agriculture. And a lot of Curry's work from 1936 to 1946 can be seen as in some ways painting the ideals of the College of Agriculture, which was one of the most progressive and one of the most far-reaching colleges within the state. Here's a great example, Our Good Earth from 1942. And this was actually used as a war bonds poster. Um, so here's this, you know, big muscular brawny farmer, you know, growing the excuse me, growing the crops, which will feed not just, you know, on the home front, but it'll fill, feed the troops fighting overseas and you know you're not fighting just for you know the homeland here you're fighting for the next um, generation interestingly enough I've seen a photograph of the model that Curry used for this it was a man who actually worked um, for the College of Agriculture he was a bit of a kind of a doofus looking guy I mean, he, was this, you know, he was not the kind of you know stud of the prairie that <laughs> 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 So, seriously, I mean, it's kind of quite remarkable how much of a makeover John Stuart Curry gave him when he painted this portrait. But Wilde pretty much hates this stuff. He really doesn't like this work by Curry. So he's kind of rebelling against it. He doesn't like the painting style. I mean, in fact, Curry was often criticized. I mean, John, uh, Thomas Hart Bent, you know, there's the three big regionals, Thomas Hart Bent and Grant Wood and John Stuart Curry. Wood was meticulous with his painting, and Benton was pretty, pretty tidy too. And actually, both of them had a real problem with Curry. They kind of said, you know, John, you're a great painter, you've got great ideas, but basically, boy, your technique is really pretty. And there's a great, I found this, I found this catalog in the, in the files, and 
it's kind of a testimonial. It's like there's all this, all these testimonials to Curry, and there's this great essay by John Stuart Curry where he basically says, you know, John, you're great and your stuff's good, but oh, your technique is really, really bad. And so, you know, when you think about Wildey's work, Wildey is so precise, so detailed. It's not this, you know, big brushstrokes. You know, it's all the, stylistically they were worlds apart, and in some ways. They were also worlds apart. I mean, Curry does tend to kind of romanticize the landscape, which I don't think something was, was Wilde really kind of romanticized things. I mean, you know, here's, you can just look at the, the contrast here. I mean, there's, and that, and then, you know, they're almost from exactly the same time period, 1942, 1941. So you can just see that, you know, we're apples and oranges here. So, believe it or not, Another, this is a, I decided to put this, this one in because believe it or not, the painting I showed you earlier, the uh, American interior. If you take the American interior and you turn it, instead of having it being this way, if you turn it this way and turn the painting around, this is what is on the back. We were actually hoping at one point they were actually on two separate pieces of masonite, but no, this is literally on the back of that canvas. Helen Ashman and you know, first wife, Sylvia Fine, one of his best friends. And I think this is a kind of testimony as to how important that American interior painting is, because A, this is a major painting. I mean, you've got, again, you've got these figures kind of in a desolate, rocky landscape. Uh, Helen's kind of wearing somewhat kind of Baroque, renaissance -y type clothes. But the fact that John took what I think would be a major painting, basically turned it around, changed the orientation of it, and painted American interior on it, and then hung on to American interior, it was hanging in their house and, you know, for the rest of their lives, says how special the American interior painting is. Now another pictorial approach that Wilde failed to appreciate, as well as failing to appreciate John Stuart Curry's work, was the abstract expressionist scene that emerged after the Second World War, likely because of its resolute rejection of both drawing and readily identifiable subject matter. In short, his personal style developed not just from what he liked, but also from what he actively disliked. In addition to fellow students, Helen Ashman and Sylvia Fine, there's uh, John next to Sylvia in 1941. He befriended a wide circle of artists, Gertrude Abercrombie, Marshall Glazier, Dudley Hupler, Carl Preeby, and they all shared his interest in an art that relied more on imagination rather than depicting reality. And together, this small coterie um, championed an artistic genre that eschewed the stylistic tendency towards realism that had been the norm in the United States in the 30s and 40s, and they preferred a much more kind of personal, a much more imaginative vision. And by the way, all of these guys were basically Madisonians, except Preeby. And I was saying earlier, it always puzzled me. It's like, well, it's Carl Preeby in the, this group. These are all these Madison people that John met when he was, gosh, where does Preeby fit in? Well, they were both born a few doors, John Wilde and Carl Preeby were born a few doors apart in North 49th Street in Milwaukee. They knew each other from growing up in Milwaukee. So I was like, there's the connection, there's the connection. And Preeby was good friends with John's older brother. And in later years, Preeby and John also served a great love of ornithology together. And if you're familiar with Carl Preeby's work, I mean, he did hundreds and hundreds of paintings of birds. <coughs> Here we have Carl Preeby, Gertrude Abercrombie, Dudley Hupler, Marshall Glazier, Sylvia Fine, a friend, Arnold Dadian, and myself. And this is from 1966. And we actually have this one. This is, on, this is actually owned by the Milwaukee Art Museum, but we do actually have it on exhibit at the museum right now. Now, in 1943, Alfred Barr, Jr. of the Museum of Modern Art in New York surveyed the national art scene, and he highlighted a particular group he dubbed magic realists. These were artists, and I quote, 
who by means of an exact realistic technique try to make plausible and convincing their improbable, dreamlike, or fantastic vision. And together, Wilde and his friends formed the Wisconsin contingent of what Barr termed magic realism. And, what, and that today falls under the larger umbrella, really, of surrealism, which sought to mine dreams in the unconscious rather than the outside world for subject matter. And they were part of a larger national scene that included artists such as Paul Cadmus, there's one from 1930. There's Wilde working from himself in 1948. You can see this kind of, again, this similarity here. Uh, let's see, Honoré, Honoré Scharrer, Priscilla Roberts, George Tucker, and Europeans such as René Magritte, of course, the famous The Treachery of Images, 1928 to 29, Cecina Pazum Beep. Yeah. And then, of course, Naked Girl <laughs> Pipe by John Rowley from 2000. And so, Max Ernst, and Max Ernst was, in fact, let's go back to Max Ernst. But Max Ernst was also the, the subject of Wilde's master's thesis in 1947 which was entitled, A Survey of the Development of Surrealism in Painting and Its Chief Innovations, with special emphasis on the life and work of Marx Ernst. It's not exactly the world's most snappy title, but <laughs> you get the point. So let's see, where are we? So, many of you went to this very home. In the Milk World, his modest home outside of Cooksville, the living room was dominated by, I think you can see it here, an American Interior. For those of you who did not go there, basically this is the front door, there's the bathroom, the kitchen's behind here, and there's the porch, and you would walk down the hallway to his studio, which was at the center of the building. Right, Emma? <laughs> yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and there it is, 1971. So this is almost 30 years after it was painted, and there it was hanging right there in the house. And it was painted just before Wilde was drafted into the army. As I say, it's a seminal work because it's one of the largest paintings he did. It's 36 by 50 inches, uh, which means it's one of the largest works he produced. And while it looks backwards to Europe, and specifically Brack, with its layered pictorial planes, there's little bits of collage in this painting as well. Um, stuck on, I believe. This is stuck on, and this is stuck on. So there's still a little bit of um, collage <laughs> in this painting. Wilde, as I said, the title asserts his Americanness, and I think it can be seen as really a declaration of his own identity in the face of so much European art history. And the white wall in the foreground appears to be both an outer wall, <coughs> and the pictures hang on it, so it seems to be an interior wall. Um,